the Ukrainian flags are now flying in the city of Kherson after Russian troops withdrew from the area. Ukraine's president made a surprise visit to Kherson, the largest city retaken to date from Russia. This is the beginning of the, the end of the war. I was able to join President Zelensky uh, on a trip to uh, Kherson. He wanted to get there as fast as possible. His security were dead set against it. They told him, please don't go. At least wait so that the mine clearing teams can go through. Russian artillery could very easily strike. It was extremely dangerous. He acknowledged that and he said, I still need to go. The situation on the ground is painful and tragic, but I think what a lot of the coverage misses is the positivity and, and the resilience that Ukrainians show. Even when there's a blackout, even when there are missile strikes, people continue to try to go about their daily lives not give in to despair, not give in to depression, to keep living. My name is Simon Schuster. I'm a correspondent for Time Magazine. And I've been covering Russia and Ukraine for about 15 years. I've experienced the war inside the presidential bubble to a large extent. Because of my previous relationships with, with the president and his team, they've been super generous in letting me be a fly on the wall. The photographer who worked with me on this story, Maxim Dandyuk, I've known him for many years. He's a dear old friend of mine. We met during the revolution in Ukraine in 2014. If you ask Ukrainians, if you ask the Ukrainian president, they'll tell you this war has been going on for eight years. It's not fundamentally new, but what happened in February is a much larger scale much more violent, much more horrifying. I uh, had no dream about uh, being a war photographer, but what happened in my country more than eight years ago, I should to cover this and work with this magazine and try to spread the truth, the real situation, and try to fight against the Russian propaganda in the war. I'm really um, proud to be Ukrainian in this historical moment. I started reporting on President Zelensky before he was president. His career before he went into politics in 2019 was as a comedian, uh, as a movie producer, an actor. He made fun of the politicians that he ended up replacing. Why do you want to be president? To change everything in Ukraine. Zelensky came to power promising to be from outside the system, not corrupted by the, the oligarchs, the wealthy and self-serving elites. That's how he defined himself and I think one of the main reasons why his campaign was successful. And I think many people voted because they believed that the president that they saw on that TV show would be the president that Zelensky would become. Things were more complicated. As a wartime leader, I think President Zelensky has surprised uh, everybody. Consistently, what his advisors have told me since the beginning of the invasion is that he lets the generals do the fighting and he focuses on what he is good at, which is communication. Grabbing the attention of the world and not allowing the world to turn away. To make sure that the West, the US, the Europeans uh, actively support Ukraine with weapons supplies, with financial aid, with political support, uh, also inspiring uh, the, the public with speeches. Feel the silence with your music. Feel it today to tell our story. He's always online, he's always filming videos, posting videos. The way that he's been able to communicate, not only with his people, but the people around the world who are, who are watching this war, is, is unique to history. And I think that's been a very powerful tool for him. Premier Minister Shmogai Tut, Podolak Tut, President Tut. His decision to stay in Kyiv throughout the invasion has been so important because it was very hard morally, politically, <laughs> personally for anyone else uh, in the structure of the state, ministers, government officials, to leave because the boss was there. I think if, if Zelensky had run away, it's, it's fair to say that there would be a much higher chance that the state structure of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine as, as, a, as a country, as a, as a state, as a government, would collapse. He showed the country, and, and I think many around the world, that he is not scared. There is no reason to fear this, this invader, that, that Ukraine can win, that it will win that inspired a lot of people in, inside the country and outside to stand up and help fight this war. Ukrainians generally hold their worry about the future inside. 
People say, just give it a couple more months and, and we'll have our victory. They certainly express that belief all the time. But it's, it's, a, it's a scary time. This strategy that Russia is pursuing of bombing and freezing the country into submission is very scary. Ukraine's capital under attack again. You know, the people I talk to in Ukraine aren't sure how they're going to get through that. Uh, but if asked, uh, do you think victory is around the corner? They say, yes, we're definitely going to win. Uh, and, and victory is coming. I all the time afraid. I think everybody afraid. I just don't believe if some war photographer or soldier say me, I'm not afraid. We try to fight because we fight for our home. We don't have any choice. When I've talked about their role in history with Zelensky, it was on a train coming back from Kherson. Uh, he said, it's too early to judge my role in history. I'm not done yet. I still need to finish this thing for the country. And, and I think it, it wasn't really just the war he meant. He wants to finish this kind of cycle of oppression uh, and subjugation that Russia has pursued uh, for generations. He doesn't want to just have a temporary truce or an armistice that allows Russia to rearm and retrench and try again. He really wants to break the cycle so that Russia never attacks Ukraine again so that uh, it, it remains a, a free, independent, and sovereign country. That's how he sees uh, his role in history and, and what he wants to do. It's not just a kind of set of negotiations that leads to a ceasefire. It's the breaking of a historical cycle of oppression that's been going on since before he was alive.